very much for inviting me. I'd like to start with thanking Michael, um, Lillian, and the rest of the team for inviting me to participate in the discussion, a really important discussion at this moment in time here at Aston University. And um, having just given a talk on um, a TED talk on how important time is, I've decided that I want to make sure that I keep, even though you've now offered me a bit more time, I'm going to try to keep to my allotted time slot. Um, I will be leaving immediately after the break, so um, I'm not sure that I'm going to be here for Q&A, so maybe during the break, if there's any questions, we can have a look at that. So, um, as I said, I'm going to keep to my time slot, and the other thing that I wanted to share is the fact that, as we're in the university, I wanted to share that I've been fortunate enough to have been given two honorary degrees based on the work that I've done with um, global diversity um, and equality, and also the work that I've done with uh, women in business and minority communities. So as an entrepreneur, I also I spent quite a lot of time in um, the marketing and promotions field working on equality and diversity and running race and gender campaigns. It's in my DNA. I've done it for over 30 years. And um, it, it's just something that I do naturally. But using, race and, using the Race and Equality Act and my personal experiences as a framework, I've also advised governments. I've chaired large government quangos. I've developed and steered international um, coalitions, and I've personally um, developed uh, schemes and groups to help, if you like, swim against what I call the impercept imperceptible tide of um, intolerance, unconscious bias, institutional discriminatory practices, um, and all the other things that go um, with um, discrimination. And sometimes I feel a bit like Kim Kamut trying to hold the tight back. During this time, of course, the objective and the challenge um, that I looked to achieve was around racial and gender equality by getting the machinery of government and business to agree that inequality was no longer appropriate, it was no longer acceptable, nor was it beneficial. And that as leaders, they had to unlearn the generations of privilege that made heads of state, heads of government, heads of business, and even heads of local councils all look the same. In other words, as an, as an advisor, I was in place to help them not only talk the talk, but walk the walk um, of inclusivity. Now, if I'd been asked to do this talk on the 30th of October, instead of today, the content of the presentation would have been very different. My challenge regarding underrepresentation of minorities and women in key leadership roles would have been focused on changing the mindsets of those in power, and that invariably would have been white men, plus empowering and developing the potential of more diverse pipelines and um, making them able to uh, compete for more equal opportunities. However, since Brexit and the US vote on the 9th of November, of course there's been a sea change in the world order of politics. Liberalism, the social philosophy underpinning civil rights, international cooperation, and social equality is being threatened. The President elect of the United States has come into post with a mandate for protectionism in place of liberalism. Whilst there's always room, of course, for different Oh my goodness, sorry, my phone's about to ring. For different, uh, for different opinions and different views, building a platform on division and not unity more readily panders to those who may use race, uh, gender, sexual orientation to divide us. In our own debate on Brexit, we've already witnessed an extreme reaction of this divisive mindset um, and that was around the tragedy, the tragic murder of Joe Cox MP. With the re-emergence of the likes of Marie Le Pen in France, Gert Wilders in Holland, and now encouraged by Brexit and Trump's efforts to take our countries back, 
the protectionism fight against liberalism is set to continue. Now, I know that all sounds gloom, but I'm not here to paint a, a, a gloomy picture or scare you um, about our future. But as a woman who's been part of a struggle for over 30 years, I will say that my work in social policy around racial and gender discrimination is akin to playing snakes and ladders. Just as soon as you feel as you're getting somewhere, the ladder's pulled out from under you and you're right back where you started. <coughs> So within the context, within that context, let me speak to the subject matter I was specifically asked to address today. And that is, in order to embed diversity and inclusion as a tool in the workplace, it has to remain an effective philosophy in society. So to that end, let me share with you some work that I was recently part of, uh, which hopes to address the significant issue of racial discrimination in the workplace and offers some ways forward. So I think we all know in recent years, Lord Davis looked into the underrepresentation of women on boards, the Davis Report or the Women on Boards Report, as it was later called. And that made significant inroads in addressing the gender imbalance on corporate, board, corporate boards in the UK. As the only female of 10 board members at Choice FM, Britain's first black-owned radio station back in the 90s, and since then, various other organizations, both public and private, I faced many challenges, which led me to writing my first book, gotta give it a plug, Seven Traits of Highly Successful Women on Boards, and that was published in 2014. Also published in 2014, um, other organizations such as Green Park Executive Recruitment, Race for Opportunity, the McKinsey Report on Diversity Matters, and more recently, the Ethnicity Gap, Gap Report by Harvey Nash, another recruitment company. They all highlighted the fact that major British companies appear to have overlooked a growing pool of talented minority leaders for boards and C-suite positions. This will soon further be explored by Baroness McGregor Smith's review on issues faced by businesses in developing and promoting minority talent. As will the policy exchange review, Tough at the Top, which is also being launched tonight in, uh, or this evening in London. Again, back in September 2014, the UK's Financial Reporting Council announced that it would consider adopting provisions in its corporate code to require reporting on ethno-cultural diversity from companies. These factors, alongside the drive of Sir Vince Cable, the then Secretary of State for Business, and his successor, Sajid Javid, Sir John Parker, who was part of the Davies Review, agreed to head a team to bring business leaders together to respond to the challenge of ethno-cultural diversity on boards. The review is known as Beyond Bump One by 2021. <coughs> Pranfield School, School of Business, who's part of the review, looked at the ethno-cultural mix of the FTSE 100 and found, here, yeah, yeah. hope you can see that, the breakdown, which is, is a bit depressing, really. Um, total director positions on the FTSE 100 <coughs> was 1,087. Total directors of color was 8% of that number. There's lots more to share in the report, and I'm happy to, short, to share the links and the PDFs of all of the ones that I've mentioned. This is something every HR, chairman, board member, and CEO should be reading carefully and consider what actions they could take. I'm often told that there are more men for John on the FTSE 100 boards than there are women. I don't have to wonder what the, the equivalent is for minorities. We all know it's far less. We can do as many reviews and as many reports as we like, but it's not only about philosophies, hearts and minds, it's about the bottom line and the financial imperative. And unless more companies become color brave rather than color blind, and become comfortable with being uncomfortable, we'll all be in the same position in the next 30 years and beyond. 
So I started by mentioning that I had the privilege of writing my, my first book, Seven Traits of Highly Successful Women Again. Do you notice how I managed to put a plug in there? Yeah. <laughs> Two plugs. Yeah. So for me, it would be an even greater privilege that within my time that I could write something like Seven Traits of Highly Successful Minorities on Boards. I also hope that I'm around to see the time when there are more women on boards uh, than there are men called John. And as well as men called John, I hope to see more men called Leroy, Raj, and Patel, uh, also listed on those board members of the FTSE 100 companies. But being the eternal optimist, I live in hope, so I still think there's a chance to do that. But my call to action is that if you're a person in a position of power, you need to seriously think about making a change and making a difference. And I challenge you to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I challenge you to be color brave rather than color blind. So to close with the matter I've been asked to address, which is in order to make diversity and inclusion an, an effective tool in the workplace, it has to remain, sorry, in the workplace, it has to remain an effective philosophy. But I say, philosophies won't matter one jot unless we turn them into actions. So who will do this and when will they do it? It's already been over 30 years and I sometimes feel like I'm stuck in a Groundhog Day. You all know what a Groundhog Day is, yeah? So it's happening over and over again and we're not moving forward. So the question that I the questions I leave you with, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? Thank you very much. And, um,